All right, everybody. Welcome back to another tour life. You got myself and Yuli as always. Silas is not joining us this week, so it's just us. It's, this is pre-recorded. Obviously, uh, we can't go live, unfortunately, today. Uh, but Silas will be back, I believe, in a week or two. So next week will be pre-recorded as well. And I think I'm going to try, obviously, next week we have Worlds coming up. So I think I'm going to try to maybe snag one or two interviews leading into Worlds going into next week. Uh, it will also be the first day of the World Championship. So, Yuli, we got to figure that out. I'm not sure exactly yeah. how that's going to work right now. Uh, but we'll figure that out. Uh, with that being said, though, we do actually are we are currently looking for two new positions uh, at Tour Life. So, those two positions, the first one being someone that has adequate experience and also interest in social media. We're looking for someone to potentially help us run the social media accounts on Tour Life. Uh, so, if that is something that is interesting of you, where whether it be Instagram clips. Uh, tweets, all these type of things to promote the show, but also to show clips and highlights from the show. Uh, you you can email Brad, B-R-A-D, at foundationdis.com. Email your resume. Let us know what would make you, why you would be a good fit to become um, our first, I guess, employee, if you will, of Tour Life. Uh, we're trying to expand a little bit, and I got a little gnat right now that I need to just destroy. But we're trying to expand the show a little bit and have, especially when me and Yuli are on tour, having someone that can help kind of run some stuff for us is going to be great. And then also, if you are someone that is interested in producing the live show itself, uh, Silas isn't going anywhere, but on days like this where Silas can't go, um, it would be nice to also have someone that, you know, we can plug in so that way the show can kind of run normal. So if you want to, you know, dip your toes in live producing tour life, also send your resume to Brad at foundationdisc.com. All right. Enough off the top there. Yuli. What's going on, man? You're back home. I'm back. I'm back home. Man, I'm back home for a couple days. It was a much needed couple day break for sure to reset before the world championships we had. I mean, you and I were both on the road for what, like a month or something without being home. Yeah. It, it was a, it was a long time right after getting back from Europe too. So home for three days and then, uh, flying to Vermont on Friday and, uh, you know, we're going to okay. get our grind back on, but it, no, it's good to be home. Yeah. That's all I got going. I'm just kind of digressing and relaxing here at the homestead. I'll probably have to do like a uh, a walkthrough at some point of the place we're staying at because this is one of the nice air one of the nicest Airbnbs we've had. We have one of the bedrooms has like military beds almost of where there's six bunk beds in there, so we can almost house an entire family just in one bedroom. But this place is massive. It's got a huge backyard. We're probably gonna put the practice baskets up back there to get some practice in maybe shoot some fun videos and content but yeah we're just about 18 20 minutes uh we're in Stowe getting ready for the world championships uh up at smuggler's notch so i've been able to already get two practice rounds in well two and a half practice rounds in i've played both courses we'll do a little preview later on this show but we have a lot to discuss this week. Obviously, me and Yuli will do our own tournament recap of what went down for us at D-Glow. Then we'll go through all the, the craziness that happened in, on the MPO side, talk about a new winner, a big winner on the FPO side. Uh, then the European Disc Golf Championships went down. We'll do a little update on the Disc Golf Pro Tour standings because as of right now, there's only two more events, the World Championships and MVP Open. Last two events to get points um, outside of a couple silver events, but those are the last two big events to get points leading into the Tour Championship. Uh, we'll do the Worlds Preview, and uh, we've got some listener questions at the very, very end of the show. And that will be it. So, uh, Yuli, how did, how did D-Glow go for you? About, honestly, about what I thought. I knew I, <clears throat> I hadn't practiced. I don't think. I think I did. I think I practiced last week Wednesday before we got on the show, and uh, 
it was like I I had a feeling it was going to be I was excited about it, but I had a feeling it was going to be tough. I mean, the place is long. There's a lot of OB. That what the OB wasn't the problem. It was long. Very very long. And being being the player that I am, I don't have the big distance, so I have to be extra perfect. Um especially out there. Like things have to just like I have to hit every shot kind of perfect into the right spots to be able to get up some of those big hills and I just I wasn't crisp really every round. I I kind of got behind the eight ball early a few times to where um you know, I basically needed to go bogey free every round. Mm. And I had too many bogeys. It's not that hard to take pars out there at all, but when you're pushing for birdies and good scores, they can creep up on you for sure. I, I found myself having a few rollaways that cost me on some shots, and I ended up taking like 45th, which really I feel like wouldn't be that bad if we had a full field. Obviously, we didn't. We had only the top like 75 or 80 people of the best players on tour. So you would have just added in like – 40 other just rando kind of people it would have yeah, I mean, you know, it might looked not a little bit bad. probably better. And there was a huge yeah. gap. Like you could really see a gap between, I was looking at it honestly at massive, at, especially at like people who played really great middle of the pack, bottom cashers, and then a bunch of people who, I mean, good people didn't cash, but they were still well under par. It seemed like, um, and then there was, like, where I was, like, below me, you could tell, like, there wasn't a lot of big power throwers or right where I was, even above me, not a lot of power throwers out there. Um, and so it was just a place that I just didn't feel comfortable. Uh, I, I would – I wish I had another shot at it because I felt like I learned a lot playing the tournament of where to go, where to not to go, where to kind of lay up. Game plan wasn't quite crisp. I think it was too new of a course. But that's where I was, yeah. I ended up missing cash by, like, I think it ended up being seven. I was two under. Last cash was nine under, which was pretty good score, mm -hmm. honestly. Yeah. No, it's, uh, that's how, that's you know, I think me, some yeah. of the changes, yeah, some of the changes we'll, we'll kind of talk about here in a little bit. But I think, for the most part, they made the course more challenging for players that play bad, that were playing poorly. They didn't really, outside of maybe hole 16 and hole 18, those were really the only two holes that I thought got harder for the entire field. Every other hole that they added OB or changed the basket placements or whatever it may have been, that really only affected bad shots. They didn't really affect good shots and really didn't change any player's strategy going into those holes so uh it definitely played more difficult for the players at the bottom of the field and uh yeah my my tournament was uh, it was it was very unfortunate timing for me because where i'm sitting right now in the standings i was really looking forward to having a good finish at this tournament to really boost myself up the standings uh last year i believe i took ninth or tied for ninth something i i think it was tied for ninth um so i felt had success at this course felt really good about this course uh but unfortunately got sick got really sick actually to the point of where i was kind of scared that it was covid and that i was going to have to obviously drop out of the tournament if, if it was covid luckily covid test came back negative all good there uh, which I think ended, uh, ended up me just having like a really bad flu. And what I've noticed too, I don't get sick very often, but what I've noticed now is since I've got Lyme disease, every time I get sick now, it's, it's way worse. Like I'm still uh, dealing with the congestion and, and nasal stuff. Yeah. And this is, this is over a week now. And I just feel like my immune system takes so much longer to fight things off and also reacts to things a lot differently now that I have Lyme. So those first couple days, man, absolutely brutal. Um, I was on the fence on day one, even like going into the day. I was on the fence of whether or not I even should play, but I'm like, I need these points so freaking bad. I like maybe I can just, you know, get through the first round and you know rest the whole bunch and feel better for the the rest and and fight back and get some points. But unfortunately, like day one was literally the worst that could have happened. So day one, 
Uh, you know, I, I wake up, I, I'm super achy. I've got like the chills. I've got the, uh, I'm super lethargic. I've got no energy. Right. And so I'm warming up. Disc is not popping out of my hand at all. Like it's coming out 70%. Like I have no power at all. And I'm like, all right, I just need to get through this round. Let's hopefully play this round in like three hours. And I had an early tee time. I was teeing off at 10 something. So I was like, I was one of the first cards out. I was like, let's get this round done, get home, get in bed and just try to recover. Well, we get to hole two and I'm about to throw my upshots on hole two horn. I'm like, oh gosh, we proceeded for the next, I think hour and a half to two hours to potentially play again. And then a horn, like I, I fully warmed up again because they said we're going to play walked out to the hole and you know i think it was like three or four minutes before they were going to give us the horn to play lightning literally struck on top of the property so horn comes down another 30 minute delay so it was this nastiness of like cold windy wet rain and i'm like having to warm up and not warm up and then warm up and then not warm up and it was the last thing i wanted to do uh, so I was able to just complete the round, which I was very happy with. Might've been my first round ever. I don't know. Someone can go fact check me. Might've been my first round ever without any birdies. I had zero birdies all round. Uh, I took a triple on hole three. That was unfortunately the, the first tee shot I had after like the hour and a half, two hour rain delay, uh, or, you know, thunder, uh, lightning delay was hole three and I just yanked my shot OB and then my second one ended up going OB on the right at the very, very end. So it took a triple there and I think I had two other bogeys throughout the round. So I shot five over on day one, but I was like, all right, I got through it. It's fine. Day two didn't feel any better and the wind was absolutely, re- what was your tee time day two? Do you know? Right. I was, uh, I was two over par. Do you, were you morning? Or three over. I was three over. Okay, so you're probably... So you're pretty early then. Yeah. It was was crazy windy. When we were warming up, there was just gusts that were like ripping through at like 30 miles per hour. One thing that I think would be really cool in the future would would be to see uh, if we ever do go to morning, afternoon tea times on day one and then afternoon, morning tea times on day two, you can actually see how the fields play based off of the tee times, that's something you do in golf. And it's a very interesting stat because I think in this scenario, if you did play early on round one and you played early on round two, granted the people that played early on round one were all the worst players in the field, the way that they did tee times, but those were the more difficult times to play. And that would just be an interesting thing to see as tournaments go. It'd be another storyline to talk about like, oh, this person had the worst draw and they still were able to win the tournament, right? Yeah. Um, But day two was crazy wins. I got three birdies. Day three was starting to feel like a little bit better, I guess, uh, but still had no power. Three birdies. Day four, the achiness and lethargicness and my power, came. all that stuff kind of went away and my power came back, but the congestion was still there. The cough was still, all that. But I was like, dude, let me just take some stronger medicine. I felt a little bit better and got 10 birdies on day four. So uh, I finished with a good round. Unfortunately, bo- bogeyed the final, the final hole, which always sucks. Um, finishing your tournament with a, a missed circle one putt like that. But uh, that's how my tournament went. It kind of sucked, honestly, quite frankly, but... At the end of the day, I think it was something I can build on because I don't think any tournament here on for the rest of the season is going to be as hard as that for me. So it's something I can kind of like get that mental, right. um, you know, you know, build off of that, I guess you can say. Um, another story that I have from the tournament, I thought my disc got stolen. I don't know if you saw that. I tweeted out um, – Someone came up to me when I was practicing and said, Hey man, have you picked up your disc from the lost and found? I was like, no, I, I went over there and looked, I had nothing. He's like, Oh, I saw it there earlier. And I was like, no. And then he ran over there and then came back and was like, Oh yeah, I was there earlier. It's not there now. And I was like, all right, well, hopefully I get like a DM from someone being like, Hey, I found your disc in lost and found. Let's meet up, which I hate by the way, but 
I was hoping for that. And then I tweet out something along the lines of being like, Hey, if you stole my disc, I hope the worst happens to you. Like you have the worst disc golf karma or, or any, or I was basically saying like too, like if anyone sees a white roach with my name on it, know that that person stole that disc. They are a thief. Make sure you watch them with a careful eye. Uh, and then it happened to just show up in uh, Lost and Found the next day. So I don't know oh. how or what, or who, but uh, my disc got back. So that was super nice. Um, so I lost no discs. Did you lose any discs over the week? Because that no. course, you can lose discs. No, I All didn't right. lose any discs. Leaving, yeah. leaving D-Glo with no d- disc loss is always a good, a good sign. Um, all right, let's jump in to what went down. Uh, what was, what was some of your biggest takeaways from, from the tournament? Um, let me think here. Biggest takeaways from the tournament. I think it's like the longest, hardest course I've ever played in my life. (laughs) I think that's one. Do you think it was a fair challenge? I've been thinking about that and I do think it, I do think it was a fair challenge. I really do. Because when I'm looking at the scores, like five under a round is a really good, is a really good score and very obtainable for really anybody in the field. And that got you, what did that get you? Probably pretty close to top 10, uh, probably top 10, honestly. I would have finished you tied for seventh. There you go. So with that happening, and then I I felt like we were talking about this seven to eight under a round was going to win you the tournament. I think that was the number. So I think it's just a really tough course. The one thing that I was surprised about is I thought that there would be more really low scores and more really high scores, like for the same person. You know what I mean? Somebody going like seven Mm -hmm. down and then two over or something at the top, and that really never happened. It was like if yeah, if you I shot think like the sevens, front nine always shot seven. I think the front nine might be a little soft, right? And so there's yeah. there's a lot of holes out there where taking taking a bogey is kind of tough, but birdie is 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 feasible. And so I think that's where if they could holes fifteen through eighteen, if they could figure out a way of like, hey, how do we make most of the course play like these holes? then I think you would have something. Um, yeah. Because if you just look kind of down the scoreboard of how players played, you know, I don't want to call anyone out, but, uh, you know, I just popped on Kyle Klein's final round here. Kyle Klein was, uh, what is this, six under through seven holes, finished three under. Yeah. He, after seven holes, ne- never got another bir- birdie again and then doubled 16 and bogeyed 18. So... Uh, and that's not, un, you know, that's not uncommon. You've got Gavin ba- yeah. Babcock, same thing, six under through seven holes and then finishes the last stretch at two, four over. So there was a lot of people. And, and even if you go to our leaders here, you know, um, you look at Simon, Simon played the last four holes, one under Eagle played the last four holes, uh, even, and then, uh, Chris and Cole played the last four holes, both one over. So even the guys that were playing the best struggled. It reminded me of uh, Sula on how you really had to just mm. come out uh, and get like six, seven under on Fire. the nine. Otherwise, the back nine could get you. Um, yeah. And I'm, one, I'm wondering if that's like – I don't know. I don't know if I like mitch, mismatching courses like that. You know what I mean? Like – Front nine really easy, back nine really hard, or back, front nine really hard, back nine really easy. I'm not. I'm not sure how I feel about that. It's like, yeah, I wouldn't say I would. I think the contract, this contract was you know? was. Yeah, I would say this contrast was a, a little bit more significant, like than I would say you probably should go for. Now, hole three is a challenging hole. Yeah. Hole three is not an easy Especially hole by any windy. means, but. But the wind was super down, right? The wind, the wind was really only an issue on on round two, and the leaders, the wind had significantly died 
uh, by the time they teed off compared to what it was for the rest of the field earlier, where I think we were throwing into like a 25 mile headwind, which makes that hole super dicey. But outside of that, on the front nine, there really isn't really any holes that are super, super tough. Yeah. Yeah, I wish you could just, like, take 17 and replace it with, like, hole three and flip-flop them, you know, mm. and then take 14 flip -flop and replace em. it with, like, seven and then have, like, a few yeah, tough Yeah, just kind of change up out. a couple of them. Because there's a couple, like, the one that Calvin eagled, 10, no. That hole's hard. That no, 11. Hard. Or no, no, yeah, it was 11. 10. It was no, 10. 10. Yeah, yeah. 10's a hard, hard shot, to, but there's hard to birdie. But there's no, yeah, you it's like the easiest par on the planet. Correct. Um yes. really hard. Very to very though. challenging. Yeah, you have to throw two really good shots. Yeah. And really just the second shot has to be really freaking good to even give yourself a look. Yeah. Uh but the majority of people you can just spray your tee shot off that one. Um but let's let's talk a little bit about Simon here. Simon back in the winner circle. Wins again, goes 11 under, 10 under on the weekend to, to pull off the win. Uh, he wasn't by any means out of it. There was a whole bunch of people in the mix for the first two rounds, but he just absolutely boat raced the field on the weekend, uh, just shooting a perfect uh, 10 under par, uh, no bogeys final round, played really, really well. He was first in C1 in reg in the field, second in stroke, strokes gain T to green, Third in strokes gained C1X. First in birdie percentage at 50%. And uh, the big you know, storyline around all of Simon's play was hole 16. So I kind of want to jump into that now of what ended up happening on hole 16. Um, this, this was from Simon's words. He said, I was in a fortunate situation where I got Eagle to throw first. Eagle was only two back, and I, was, I just told myself that if Eagle goes OB – then the smartest play is just to try and throw as hard as I can at the basket and try to go OB long because you get a drop basically from like 10 feet. Uh, I never thought of that game plan before I stepped up to that hole, but in the moment it all came together and I think it was the right play. So we talked about this, Yuli, last week. We talked about when we found out that the drop zone on hole 16, even though it was an island hole, the drop zone was not mandatory we mentioned that this could be a, an issue coming down yep. the stretch. Now it literally worked exactly the way that we basically talked about of how that tee shot now comes really stressful to Simon to now all of a sudden it comes to a super easy shot. Now he said, um, I don't know if he mentioned it being a hard shot going long OB. I don't think he did say that. No, he didn't. Yeah. He just said, throw hard. That's an easy shot. If you step up to that T pad and you're like, I just, I'm just going to try to throw OB long. I, I rate that uh, a 2.5 out of 10 difficulty. And the only reason it's not a one is because of the situation of him playing to win. Would yeah. you agree? Not hard. Um, I'm trying to think. It's so, not that hard, no. No, because oh, yeah. I thought about doing the same thing final round, honestly, because I'm like, I've. Like nothing I was doing was working. It's kind of a fluky shot, any way you look at it, unless you throw an absolute dime piece down the right, the down the right fairway. I I ended up yep. um, playing the left fairway with the sidearm flex the last two rounds because I missed the island going down the right side the first round. So, yeah, I don't think it's hard at all. I mean, yeah, I mean the play. Uh, of course, I thought it, it would be ridiculous if he didn't do that. If he didn't just rip it past the bat, that's what I was thinking when I was kind of commentating on it on Jomez, because that's the first time that I saw it. Yep, I was not surprised at. at yeah, him. no. And looking looking at his uh, his previous scores on that hole, he doubled the first day with two OB. So uh, you know, going OB on his drive, and then I'm assuming trying to make the putt and his putt going OB as well. He bogeyed it on day two. And then ends up parring it on the third day, throwing it yeah. into circle two and then missing the putt. So he didn't have great success on that hole either. It wasn't like he was stepping up. And like you said, it's not a hole because some people are like, why wouldn't he just throw for the birdie and just try to like end it there? No, 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 no. If you have a two-shot lead going into hole 17, 18, you pretty much have ended it. 
birdieing 17 and 18 back to back is not an easy feat. Not that many no. people did it. Uh, you know, the only people actually to do it the final day was Jake Hebenheimer, Gannon Burr, and shout out to Eric Oakley also did it. So yeah. three people in the entire field birdied it. Both, <laughs> the both only hole 17 and 18. 18's easy to play for par. Very easy. 17, yes. not so easy to play for par. Tee shot's tough. It's a, The tee shot is very tough. So two shots going into the last two holes, going par, par. Very, you're probably going to win. But 17, you go out of bounds off the tee. That's not a guaranteed safe shot off the tee. So I've, so a little, little pushback on that. A little pushback. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got, uh, you, you've got the announcers going absolutely wild about this play. Now, I don't know if they didn't know about this as an option. Um, one thing I will say that sometimes happens with the live commentary is someone will say something or someone will see something and then they just will try to make that a trend. So throwing OB is normally never something that we're trying to do. There's a couple holes where, yeah, maybe we throw a roller and we're like, you know what? If it goes 500 feet long, that's fine. Cause there's OB 20 feet behind the basket. I can just have it tap in par. Yeah. There's few holes like that. Cause in my opinion, those holes are flawed the way that they're designed. This was one of those holes, and then it all of a sudden just turned out to be like they were starting to talk about people throwing OB on purpose, and like Eagle goes OB on 18, and they're talking about like, oh, I bet he did that on purpose. No, no. No one's trying to throw OB long on 18 on the tee shot on purpose. So I didn't really understand the, the theory behind that, but this was the smart play from Simon. I think it was the play that if people listened to our podcast last week – or watched uh, coverage of people's practice rounds. I'm sure people talked about it. This wasn't probably that surprising, only to those that were kind of in the dark of this being an actual play and an actual option there. So uh, smart play by Simon, uh, and ultimately ends up taking it down. Um, Eagle honestly had a great tournament, though. Eagle played great, very, very solid. He was actually probably the most consistent out of... Yeah. Uh, everyone, you know, contending there at the end, of, at the end, he shot 57, 59, 59, 58. So super, super consistent from Eagle across all four rounds. Uh, biggest, biggest issues, final round for Eagle, his putt on hole one ends up hitting the, you know, elevated basket rolls OB super unfortunate to take a bogey there. And then uh, he ends up going OB on his drives on hole 16, on hole 17, and hole on 18. And that basically just completely ended yeah. it for him. He wasn't out of it by any means. No. He ends up losing by three. So he ends up, you know, birding two of the last three holes and taking a par. Now we're all of a sudden in a playoff situation. So he wasn't out of it by any means. But what were your thoughts on Eagle? He plays really good at this tournament. Yeah, I thought he I thought he played good. I think um one second. No, you're good. Just a little for our audio listeners, just a little camera update, little camera update. We're back though. All all good. Yeah, no, I thought Eagle played really good. I think the I think the biggest thing about that whole round that I saw um that really set the tone for the whole round was the fact that Simon starts off the round with a 60-footer right in the heart. Eagle misses his putt low, goes out of bounds, two-shot lead right there. Bam. Huge momentum shift right off the bat. Simon's comfortable, plays with the lead the whole entire time, doesn't relinquish it, um, even with a couple things not going his way down the stretch. And then, yeah, of course, 16, 17, 18, it's always nice to see your competitor when you have a lead go out of bounds and you don't have to have any stress at all. So... I felt like I felt like it was from the first hole. Like that set the tone for the whole round. Simon felt comfortable. He had the lead. Everybody was chasing him. I think honestly, I don't think Eagle was the one putting the pressure on really. I I, I think he was battling Eagle, but seeing what Calvin was doing in the middle of the round had to have made him a, a bit nervous if he knew. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because the, he's tied with actually Calvin. Calvin's three show, three holes ahead. But the 
the thing with that course is three holes ahead on the back nine is like you're tied. Like you, those birdies are so tough to get. A few of those birdies are so tough to get that three ahead and being tied with them, like you're, it's really hard to find birdies back there. As we saw, I mean, uh, what did he get? Uh, he missed 16. He missed 18. Missed 17. Did he par them all? Simon? Yeah. Are you doing, or Calvin? Oh, yeah. Si- Simon on the back nine, uh, only birdie 10, 12, 14, and 15. And 15, so 15 is a really good birdie. 15 is a really good birdie. and uh, But 14 and 12, you're, you're probably looking to birdie on those holes. And then 10 is a really good birdie as well. So he did yeah, get so, a couple tough ones, but yeah. Right, but but you know, with Calvin being that far ahead and blah, 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 I felt like that was where the pressure was, even though Eagle's on there and Eagle's always close. But it didn't look like he had the fire. You know what I mean? He wasn't knocking down the – the big putts until um, 13 down the hill. I thought that was a big momentum shift because he has the lead at three. Eagle knocks down the 60 footer after trying to go Annie over the entire forest. That was insane. If you haven't watched coverage, go check that that hole out. That was nuts. <laughs> and then he comes alive. He's only two back again, and we got a ball game. Um, but the thing was uh, 14 up the hill, easy birdie for both of them. And then the uh, yeah, they both crushed their drives, is, is, which definitely yeah, 15 helps. Fifteen down the whole hill, very tough, very tough hole. Uh, and then of course the storyline we already played that out: sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. So from hole one, and then hole you, uh, thirteen were the momentum shifts. I felt like. No, I think you know. I think most of the front nine we've talked about, like you know, how do we buff up the front nine? But I want to talk. I want to talk about hole 15 real quick because I think one thing this course is really missing right now is a par five. I don't, I don't, I don't think, you know, high level courses should be without par fives, you know, at least one. I would ideally like to see two. I think 15 have the same tee pad, have the same basket. (coughs) You throw OB down the left, you throw OB down the right. And then all of a sudden you could turn that into a par five. I think people can go aggressive off the tee if they want to, but I think with OB on both sides like that, most people are going to lay back and and not even try to push it into those tree line. And then those that even push it into the tree line. Now your second shot is way riskier, obviously with OB on the left and OB on the right. Um, I think that could be a cool change moving forward. No, I like that. And I, I think like even, if you add the out of bounds on the left and right all the way down the fairway, being able to yes. open it up a little bit at the green around that, open it up because there is some natural rough around there, that's fine. Yep. But off the tee, if you go out of bounds, I'd like to see them put you at that drop zone. Um, oh, which interesting. Is a short tee. That way we are not looking for disc, and then it's an easy spot. You go out of bounds, you get your disc, you go straight to the drop zone. There's no backup. Huh, interesting. There's nobody looking. Well, I think you yeah, I would, I, right here. I can't see. It was so high in the trees. I couldn't tell. And you're all wishy-washy where people are going out of bounds, and then it just kind of speeds up play. So you're, if you go out of bounds, you're bogeying and uh, push people through that hole. Yeah, I mean, I think I think even if you go out of bounds – Without a drop zone, you're probably bogeying on the tee shot. It'd be very hard to get up and down from pretty much any of yep. those spots that you most most shots are going to go be there. Um, all right, Chris Dickerson, a name that we really haven't talked about that much. He's had a very quiet season, but going back and looking at it, he's kind of coming on strong just at the perfect time as well with Worlds being just around the corner next week. GMC, he won last – or he didn't win, but he uh, – he came second to Ricky down the stretch, so a tournament that he has had success in. He looks like he's kind of in good form right now. He had six top tens this season, three of those coming in the last four events. So he's definitely kind of trending upwards right now. Yeah. He had a great tournament. Uh, great tournament, 60, 58, 59, 58. Also very consistent across all four rounds, finishing tied for third with Cole Radolin, which I think at this point, we got to talk about Cole being like the real deal, you know, similar to how we were talking about Gannon a few years ago. 
uh, which is crazy to think that, you know, it's, it's, it's been that long since you're, you know, that short of a time, I guess, with Gannon just popped on the scene and now he's, you know, a perennial player. But I think Cole needs to be discussed in that same way going into next year of where this is someone that has potential every week to go out and win. He's putting himself in multiple positions to do that. He already has a win and uh, yeah, tying Chris Dickerson at uh, for T3. Th- I mean, great performance there from Cole. Yeah, especially after the win over at Ledgestone and then going 14th, I believe, at Idlewild, then popping back right up in the third place. Cole's good, man. I mean, you don't win at a, a place like Ledgestone Woods, open, OB, uh, accuracy, make your putts. You don't win at a, at a place like that with not having the full package. I mean, if you look at, like, the resume that the uh, that um, Ledgestone brings, like, you have to be good at everything. You have to keep it in bounds. You have to kind of be level-headed. It's a mental grind. Um, that was what I was most impressed with with him is that he has a, he has a mind for it, right? There's a lot of people on tour that are very good, but they're missing, like, that – tough mentality right and i i feel like that's something that cole has and i think what well this year to me is like we're building the like top of the tour is what this this feels like right now is because we still have some of these newer players that um Ha, you know, bounce up like Isaac Robinson. That wasn't a name that was discussed that much two years ago. We're starting to create more and more of these staple players of where going into next year, it's like, oh yeah, these guys are dudes. Like these are the dudes. And I think Cole now has put him himself in that conversation of being one of the dudes on tour. And it's exciting to kind of see like yeah. going into next year, like who are going to be the new guys that, you know, we are now talking about week in, week in, uh, or every week rather. Um, all right, moving down a little bit more. We have Calvin Heinberg, another top five finish for Calvin. This dude is always at the top of the leaderboard. It seems like every single week, uh, you know, if he doesn't go th- too over par through the last six holes, I don't know what, I mean, he ends up losing by six. I don't know if that was enough. I mean, he was trying to do everything he could. He threw in, uh, on hole six for Eagle. He threw in on hole 10 for Eagle. That was probably the craziest five hole stretch on tour so far this season, yeah. seven under through five holes. I mean, that that's an absolute nuts, um, stretch right there. Too better than perfect on holes. You can't do better than perfect. Like yeah, I could see somebody like going, you know, six under in that stretch with a throw in and you being like, that's crazy for him to keep it going. But to do it two times in a five hole stretch, bro. And one was sidearm. One was yeah, backhand. I mean, to cap it off. Yeah. Crazy. And, and again, one was on probably, you know, one of the more difficult shots hole 10 second shot is probably one of the more difficult shots on the entire course. Um, like the ceilings, like, I mean, he, he obviously went through a little trees and a little, uh, leaves at the very, very end, but like the ceiling is not massive there to get, no. to get up to the basket. You have to challenge the ceiling. So ridiculous by Calvin as always, uh, someone to obviously be on the lookout this week, uh, or next week for worlds. Uh, and then rounding out your top 10, you have, uh, Kevin Jones, Isaac Robinson, Ricky Wysocki, Anthony Barella, and Jake Hebenheimer and Gannon Burr. A couple of names wanted, you know, spotlight a little bit. Did you see Ricky Wysocki's caddy? No. You did not see Ricky. I think that door is locked, Gooseman. Wow, that door is not locked. Are you talking about Never Zach? mind. Our front door. No, I'm talking about Gooseman right now. Because he just walked in the front door and it was not locked. So that is a little spooky, uh, but he is in. Um, no, I'm saying Ricky's caddy. Ricky's caddy this week. Zach? Yeah. Yeah. He had the roller cart and then he had a full bag as well. He was double dutying it. He had double duties. Really? It was nuts. You guys you guys have both rooms down the second uh, second level. Yeah. He uh he was I mean on a course like toboggan to have to do bag on the back and roller cart the dude was getting massive amounts of calories burned per day I'm sure <laughs> it's 
especially that final day. That final day was so hot. It was so hot that final day. I, I want. I don't. Uh, his calves must be absolutely on fire. So maybe Ricky is giving him like a nice little calf massage or something. Uh, Kevin so Jones continues to have some solid play. Kevin Jones, uh, thoughts thoughts on Kevin's performance the last couple of weeks? Training Pretty at solid the right time. I mean, he lo- he looked good. It, uh, it looked like at the beginning of the season he was having problems with his backhand, honestly. Like his timing was off. A lot of okay. early releases, a lot of late releases. I played with him um, in Europe. Same thing. And he just seems like he's trending. When that dude's on, like he makes every putt. He, I, th- I think he's like, I think if it's calm out, that dude's fire. I think if it gets windy, kind of tough. He That's likes to throw those very understable, uh, understable discs. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And I think he fared well the second round over there, and he 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 played very well during the during the win. So if he can figure that stuff out, he has that super stable X one that he kind of flexes around. I'm kind of rambling on about him, but uh, he's just trending at <laughs> the right direction. He's trending at the right time. Yeah. Uh, Jake Hebenheimer, great final round, shoots uh, 11 under par to move up 19 spots and into the top t- 10. Fantastic job. Uh, there's a lot of names on here we can go through that didn't cash just because, again, we talked about the field was 73 people. So the cash line was like ridiculously, we said it was nine. So you, you top, tw- yeah, top, top tw- uh, T28 because there was three people tied for 28th. Yeah. You had to get top 28 to uh, to cash at this event. So obviously lots of people, lots of top players ended up not cashing at this event. But one name that I think some people, you know, we mentioned was playing in this tournament. I think some people were very curious to kind of see how uh, his skills would translate. Now he is playing multiple events as well. So this won't be the first and only time we see him. But Manubu Kajiyama, uh, who currently is the highest rated player, I think ratings are dumb. I will continue to say I think ratings are dumb, but uh, he finished. He ends up finishing in 66th place out of the 73 players, 41 shots off the lead. I don't think this course suits his game. You know, I think this is a um, definitely more on the power side. I don't know if I'm, I'm assuming that probably isn't uh, his go-to. The dude um, rips. Just because he way. isn't the oh, he does rip. Okay, well, I was trying. Well, then I don't know why he didn't play well, <laughs> or or I was trying to give him. Ex- I was trying rips. to give him an excuse. I was trying. I was trying <laughs> to give him something. Uh, he ends up shooting 65, 70, 69, 67. Okay, we'll leave yeah, it on that jet, jet, jet lag. lag. I think he's playing this this upcoming week, so we'll see. He's also yep. playing at Worlds, so we'll see what happens. But um, but yeah, don't don't look too much into ratings, folks. Um, all right, course changes. What did you think about the the three different basket locations for those holes? Love them. Fan, like, is that something that you want to see more of? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Give it okay. a different look. I think especially – and the fans, too. I think playing the same course four days in a row, you know, I love four-day tournaments. I think four-day tournaments, especially for like the elite plus, the majors, the big, the big tournaments of the year, I think four rounds is definitely the best way to do it. Um, I love it. I love it for all aspects. And I, I think we should continue to not just with basket locations, but even mandos, even tee pads. Let's continue to push the envelope of changing courses day by day and just see what ends up because I agree with you. I thought as a player, I thought it was incredible and I've only really seen positive things from uh, the people that ended up watching as well on, on, you know, the different basket locations. So I would love to see them even do it more. Maybe next year let's do nine holes and maybe D is not the only tournament to do it. Right. Maybe yeah. let's, uh, let's have some other courses look at D and be like, Hey, that worked pretty well for them. What can we do? Um, Thoughts on hole 18, because what you said, I agree with hole 18. If you play for par, very easy to par. So I don't like that. I don't like the idea that like you can just throw three really simple shots to, you know, win a tournament on hole 18. So what are your thoughts on this? 
the tee shot goes up the hill and you've got that big landing area right there that you're trying to land. Then you've got those two trees that you can go either in, to, in between the two trees or wide of those trees. At those two trees, cut the OB line and then make a gap, a force carry from those two trees to the next landing zone, which is like, you know, 100 feet outside the basket. So that way, if you throw a bad tee shot, everyone was just chipping to that landing strip. Like that was in yeah. the middle to where they could just chip a sidearm really easily to the basket. Let's take away that landing strip in the middle. Let's make that all f- OB and, and force people now to either throw a more difficult shot all the way over, or now you're just like laying up to the tree and then trying to get up and down from, you know, 300 feet, 325 feet instead of, you know, 250, 225. What are your thoughts on that? I don't mind that. Um, I don't mind that. Yeah. I think. See, I have a little pushback sometimes when you talk about pars too easy. I, I feel like there should be a way to play a hole for par. There should be because there, there's like yes. that, because that in golf, like that's like I, something that's a skill is to be able to understand the course play your iron to this spot, play to the safe side of the green to putt it for par. Like that's how tournaments are won on the PGA tour. And so I feel like there has to be like playing. There's still stress though. That's yeah, the thing bit. is I'm like, there's, it, there's still a stress in that regard. I think if you stepped up the whole full 18 and you're like, I'm playing this for par, I, I don't know how much stress you have. I think this. I None think of those shots too, are stressful. I think it's just too short of a hole. That's the problem. I don't. I think it's a really tough par four to get birdie, but I. I just think that like holes like that, they're just tough birdies, and um, yeah, I think that if a longer hole in that same that same design, on a longer hole, bogey's staring you right in the eye, and but you can still get par, but par is also yeah. tough. You know what I mean when it when it's a bit farther because then you're having to throw. Any time a, a professional player at our level has to throw a 250 foot shot to get into a perfect position, it's the easiest thing he ever did. Like if I can go 250, yeah. 250, 250, I outdrove that hole. You get what I mean? Like yeah. and so I'm never in trouble because 250 feet is cakewalk for us. It better be at this level. Yeah. But in order to throw 350, 350, 350 to get a par, now you're talking like that's that's tough to to or even 300, 300, 300 with OB and stuff around. Yeah, yeah, exactly. To be able to get par like that is that is a tough task to do. Doable, and if you do those shots, you're getting there. But at one point, you're going to have to throw one really good shot or a bunch of or one really great shot or a bunch of solid shots in a row. You know what I mean? So I feel like yeah. the distance is what is what and is like costing whole 18. I would agree with shot, you too. That on... shot is tough. It's through a tiny gap with a freaking limb tree right there. Like it, it's like kind of a tough shot <sighs> for, for non sidearm throwers for sure. Yeah. For a sidearm, it's not, it's not the hardest shot. Um, but I, I will, I will agree with you on, you know, maybe not having that, you know, I ideology on every hole, but to me, I think I can pass on 18 on taking away the, the easy par. I agree with you. I, I maybe don't want to see that on hole five or hole 12 yeah. or hole 14. But 18, I think I'm okay with there isn't an easy way to play for par. Like you have to execute to – you still have to execute to get a par. Yeah. Um, that would just be my only thing. Last thing I have on course changes – if they need some manual labor, if they need some uh, some some you know brute strength to get out there and help them, I will volunteer the log on hole five, right of the basket. That log needs to freaking go, man. I saw so many shots, so many shots that were going to skip OB right because there's OB over there. There's an OB line over there. I saw so Ricky many shots right that were to going to skip, hit the log part. And I'm like, that shot was not a good shot. It was fading away. It, whether well, it was, a, I saw backhands. I saw what forehands. If playing for that. It shot? was. F- 
No, if they're he, not. They're not playing to try to hit a log two feet off the ground. They're not. They're not playing for that. It, it's bumpers. I don't like it. That <laughs> hole had bumpers on it for bad shots, and I don't like it. Those were bad shots. That that log was not there. That thing, those discs were going to skip 100 feet or finish 100 feet right of the basket and B.O.B. Instead, they hit the log. Well, how about so the little, let's get the rid of that long angled OB they had behind the basket. That's what I was pissed about. It like a nice little uh, directly OB, behind OB, the basket. And you're then saying? it just goes yeah to the left side. <laughs> and so people were like going. Yeah, I don't OB, know what was going being on there. Safe. I'm like, come on. Why didn't that line just keep going? But whatever. It, yeah, I don't know. I don't know about that one. So um, did you see the Andrew Fish tweet? He was he was not thrilled. He was not thrilled with the course. He said, "You know what's fun? Scrambling. You know what's not fun? OB right at the bleeping wood line." He did not say bleeping, but this is a family friendly podcast. Uh, he was very upset, I believe, after his first round. Um, I think this is a terrible take. I think this is a terrible take. We play so many courses that you have to scramble through the woods and all that stuff. It's okay to play a course that not every single hole. And also let's talk real quick. The rough at this course sucks balls, not because it's t- tough. It's because it's, there's thorn bushes, ro- uh, blackberry rose, uh, whatever those bushes were that just rip you apart. Oh, yeah. uh, super hard to find your disc. The pace of play would have been so much worse. Listen, if this, this whole, we had to play through that crap in in traditional golf, you try to hit a little baby golf ball. A little baby golf ball, for the most part, is going and penetrating into that stuff. When you're throwing a big disc, the randomness of people going in and popping out and having routes to get out of there is just so unlucky, honestly. Everybody who you get so, off the So ferry, fluky. It's so fluky. Anytime you get off of – that's why I'm a big advocate for out of bounds and uh, the worst penalty ever. If you throw a bad shot – I hope you lose your disc forever. Like and you'd get triple stroke. Like and people know that about me. Like don't throw a bad shot. But for people saying, "Oh, it's natural rough." There's nothing natural about me hitting the same tree kicking in there, somebody having a wide open gap with a run up and me being hugging a tree like this with thorn bushes up my yep. up my uh you, your butt. Armpit. Yep. And butt. Yeah, and me trying yep. to like it's just it's random. No, we should both be penalized a stroke. Come out here. All right, let's reset and play again and see if we can do this again. Yeah. If yeah. we want to play I, random woods golf, that's fine. That's part of a woods golf. But if you're on a, on a course like this with manicure fairways, like don't make me go into the bushes. Like it's just weird. Here's the other thing. You know, you know who the – you know who are the biggest advocates for people, uh, biggest advocates for non OB and like non uh, artificial OB guys that don't know how to hit fairways. Those are the biggest advocates. They want to be able to spray the disc wherever they can and still make par. And that is not that is not to me elite disc golf course design. To me, I want to see people that can control the flight of their discs, the people that are throwing well off the tee. Those are the people that should be rewarded and not someone that just threw it 500 feet in the middle of nowhere and then they're able to get up and down and get the same score as the person that actually landed in the fairway and threw two yeah. good shots. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, not a, not – makes no sense. Um, coverage. Uh, I, I watched only a little bit of live – mainly because I was under the weather, so I was trying to get my beauty sleep as much as possible, but I did watch some of the live on the final round. I thought it was funny that Nate Sexton brought up the drone camera as much as he did. I don't know if... The only reason we should be seeing this much drone coverage is if whoever is the drone operator is like the son of the owner of the disc golf network, or if the drone company is paying the disc golf pro tour, there needs to be something going on for us to be seeing this much drone coverage. It's not good. 99% of the time, the drone footage is not good. I'd much rather just see a normal flight, not a 10,000 feet above. And we're just like ants down here. And we just see this little thing fly. I can't even see it on my phone. That's the other thing. 
I, I wonder how many people actually watch live on their phone. I, I can't see crap on my phone. I don't know why they have the drone coverage when <laughs> – I don't know why they, they're showing as much as of, of it as they are. And I'm getting more so and much. more frustrated with the catch cam. I don't want to see any more catch cam. I want the catch cam to be a replay. I want to see the shot, where it goes. Yep. Zoom in on the bad boy. Show me where it's going. Show me the fairway. And then after it lands, I'll, uh, I would like to see how it reacted off the ground. Deal. But yep. I don't know why. I don't know how we got to this place where this disc golf thing is filmed with, here's the flight. Okay, switch to the catch cam. Bam, bam. Like, I don't know how that became, like, just the way that you watch disc golf. I promise you it looks I hate way it. better. I hate it. From the, I think it's because they're not on stands, right? So each tee box, the, the guy's not there with a tripod videoing the thing, and then you get this nice camera shot. I think these guys are actually holding it and moving around, and it's, t- it's tougher to do. And maybe it's not a great shot. Or something, but well, they have tripods. Most of them have tripods. Yeah, that's true. You're right. They don't have like the heavy duty. They don't have the heavy. They don't have the heavy heavy duty ones, but they have like the. uh, You go. What do they call those? Yeah. You go. Here's the deal. After you throw, get out of the way. Like throw your shot. Get out of the way so we can get this shot. (laughs) Don't ever tell me to get. That would be tough for most players. I would. I would. Yeah, I was gonna say heavy tough. Okay, we're guys I think like, that's hey, why, uh, I think Yuli, that's why they can't do it. <laughs> yeah. No posing. Um, Maybe, well, because I'm, I'm starting to see them put those like boxes behind. I've never seen anybody you on know, the T pads. I've never seen any. I've never seen. Oh, they don't go on top of there. I've never seen anybody on there. Oh, okay. I, I hope they I do. Think, I think that is, I think that's the ideal that's camera is like five feet if we can get five feet above the thrower so we're at like 10 feet high oh, yeah. behind the thrower is never in the way the thrower can Here's do jumping jacks all they want you, you're not gonna block the shot how about next or in three weeks let's remember this once si- silas is back i want him to f- find yep. a clip where we have both we have clip of the shot clip of shot catch cam and then we'll just take a vote. Which one looks better? Okay. Because I think it's I think yeah. it'll be unanimous. Like a beautiful wood yeah. shot of just like this disc just working its way down the fairway. And then catch cam is great for like blind shots when the disc it, disappears yes. and we can't see it or, anymore. Or when the commentary or the uh, commentators are talking about it and then you get to see it come in. You know what I mean? You already yep. saw the shot. You're talking about it, and now you see this while I'm talking about the shot. Oh, yeah, see how it comes in soft. Nice blah, little blah, replay. Blah, blah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Love that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't know what's going on. Drone. I'm, I'm but keep, now we got I'm drone. Keep... Now we got to compete with a drone The, the drone. You, you know, the next thing we need is we need, like, GoPro from, like, right underneath the thrower. Race just, car. like, looking <laughs> straight up. That, a little let's, race yeah, car let's, running yeah, through yeah, the track. Just right next to him. Oh, man. Um, all right, Luke Humphreys. Did you hear this Luke Humphreys story? This is kind of wild. So this is, a, this is recounted from a UDISC live scoring volunteer that was on Luke Humphreys' card. Um, this happened on Sunday. It, it, there was no, like, Luke Humphreys was not in the mix at this tournament at all, so it didn't really have any implications. Um, but this is what the story. So... The the card was supposed to tee off at 1227. Now, the starter at this tournament, because hole 18 was right next to us, the starter was doing some weird stuff where like we were waiting a lot of times for hole 18, and so we weren't actually teeing off on the correct time. We were a lot of times teeing off a minute, two, whatever. This ended up happening to where it delayed this card to 1230. Their tee time originally, 1227. They ended up actually teeing off at 1230. 30 um at 12 27 luke humphreys wasn't out at the tee uh but they hadn't started yet at 12 30 the card gets called off with the first player teeing luke was the next person up and as he is being introduced he is running up and runs on the tee and makes his shot uh the card moves on with no issues no delay other than the delay that the starter had given because of hole 18 
Um, and then on hole three, the tournament director, Nate Heinold, shows up and tells Luke he's going to get a par plus four penalty for being absent uh, at the start of the round. The players on the card then spend five minutes arguing with Heinold on hole three's tee pad about how they don't agree. Luke and the group then spend 20 minutes after the round at the scorer's table trying to figure out how he decided that Luke didn't make the start of his round when he was there on time to throw his first shot. Um, Luke asks for Heinold, and it goes on to more like stuff that, you know, is just he said, she said about, you know, whatever. That, that stuff I don't really care about. Um, okay. To me, this is pretty cut, cut and dry. And I think this, you know, hopefully this scenario, the PDGA or the Disc Golf Pro Tour, someone needs to step in and make a little bit more of a, uh, a little bit more of a well-rounded when we need to be showing up at the tee time. Because I don't think, because this is what the rule says right now. This is rule 811.F.5. If a player is not present at the start of the round for their assigned group, the player is considered absent and does not play the hole. A player is also considered absent if the player has not played the previous hole and is not present when their group is ready to start on a hole. The absent player receives a score par plus four for each hole not played. Open for They need to make that. Yes, they need to make this a little bit more concrete because to me, I don't think showing up 30 seconds, 15 seconds before your name is being called is what we should be doing. I, I don't think it looks good. I don't think, I just don't think it's what we should be doing. Also, we're trying to figure out who's doing scores, right? Like that's something that you have to figure out before you start. So if everyone on your card shows up in this like, you know, crazy theory or a crazy scenario, everyone shows up 15 seconds before the tea time how are you you're figuring out who's keeping score as you're walking down to hole one i guess i mean well, that's, that's to me this is like a cut and dry thing crap. like there needs part of that what's that crap. like who's keeping score what? how about we get this figured out when we all keep score so there's no more oh i'm keeping it today you're hey, keeping I'm it tomorrow w- how about we all you. keep everybody score like like a normal sport like why does it have to be this crap on my phone that i have to put in what if I, my phone goes dead? What if my phone dies? And then the next guy's phone dies. Like, why am I having to keep it on my – like, this is something that you can write on a piece of paper. I hear you. And then we all keep each other's score. There's no more – like, there will never be a bad scorecard ever. Do you know how many times I have to redo it on that whole 18 because I messed it up or somebody on my card messed it up to be like, yeah, these don't match. Well, that – okay, so what about the U-Disker? The U-Disker shouldn't matter at all. Zero percent had should have no, no input on what your score actually is, because he shouldn't even ask you. He shouldn't be like, "Hey, was that circle two? Some people ask us, "Hey, is that circle two? How far were you?" I I tell him, "Hey, your best guess. Don't ask me again. Thanks. I don't want to say that I was. I yes, I was in circle two all day today. I made two of them. Majority of majority of pros do not care about their stats. Yes, but so we all keep each other's score." Then this wouldn't be an issue of okay, we're getting there beforehand. Also, I think we talked about this before. Beforehand, unless there was a change to the course that's not in the caddy book, don't tell yes. me a spiel yes. about the course. It's my job to yes. learn the caddy book and understand how to play each hole. And when I step up there, it should. I don't want to know about be, closest to the pin. I should, I should be like this. I should be. Just like this, I'm ready to compete. Hey, g- good luck today. If that's what I don't want to know do. about macaroni dinner you know, later. I, be, I, I don't want to know about local about like, entertainment. Yeah. Hey, do you like <laughs> sidearm on this or should I throw a turnover buzz? Because it's really windy today. We didn't practice. I need to be doing this with my caddy. I don't need to be hearing about all this stuff, which I understand why, but it's all nonsense. I don't want to hear about We're the raffle. Prof- Here's the thing. <laughs> We're playing a professional event. Like when you work for somebody, you already know your job. You got introduced to the job. You show up and then you get it done, right? You talk to your boss and he's like, here's what I need from you. This is what you came in to do. Okay, boom. And then you don't talk to him for the rest of the day and you're just sitting there grinding out your job for the most part, right? If you're in construction, I need to build this house. Your Bob tells you what to do or your job, your boss tells you what to do. You go and you do that thing. Like, I already know what I'm supposed to do. I'm a professional disc golfer. I don't need 
you to tell me what the rule book says unless you changed it for some reason. Hey, there was a change to the course. This is what you need to know about the change. Perfect. Otherwise, call my name and it's my turn to go. Sorry, rant, but the bees is score, nice though. This whole the bees is nice. Thing? Knowing knowing that there's like uh, ground bees on certain holes, yeah, that yes, is actually I will that, say I want to know about that. Yes, that is. Tell me about that. that. Yeah, there are. Hey, just so you know, four, five, and six. There's bees on those. Have a good round. Um, we're gonna call you in order. Paul Uliberry, you're up, and then I'm ready to yep. go. <laughs> I don't need to be like. I love Dude, that. Um, nobody wants to keep score too. I keep score every single time I play because everybody's like. It's like this awkward yeah, no thing. I'm like, no one wants to do it. I'll keep score again. Yes, that's fine. You know why I say I'll keep score? So we don't have this awkward thing and we can get onto the tee and throw our shots. We just go. Anyways. I'm with you. The Luke Humphreys thing, uh, I think, again, they just need to concrete this out, whether it's the Disc Golf Pro Tour or the PDGA or whoever. Someone needs to figure it out to be like, Hey, everyone needs to show up five minutes before their tea time. If you're See, teeing I off at 1240, you need to be. And I don't like that either. I think whatever your tea time is, what if I'm late and I got stuck in traffic and I get there right and they call my name? I should be able to pull out my disc and throw my shot. That's my tea time. I'm no, there on should. time. No, no, so no, 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 because, because if, if, no, 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 Yuli, if, if 1240 is your tea time. If 1240 is your tea time, okay, and everyone knows that you have to be at your tea time five minutes before, or let's just say a minute before, whatever it is, and you don't show up time. at that time, it's the, same, it's the same thing as you showing up right now at 1241. It's yeah, the so same it's, exact it's thing. Not, it's not five minutes before your tea time then. It's, your tea time is now instead of 1241, it is 1246 is your tea time. Because then they will go through the the tea time. The tea time is for the fans. The tea time is for the fans. The tea time is specifically for the fans to know when you tee off. It shouldn't be when we show up to the tee. Is what I'm trying to say. I don't think our tea time should be. I don't think we should all us showing up 15 seconds before we throw. I think is is not good. I don't think that's a good. No, I don't. I've never done that. Unless I was late. I think it looks bad. Yeah, sure. It, it looks bad. It looks like you're unprepared and blah, blah, wow, blah. Wow. How are you your, late? But that's are, are, your, aren't you warming that's up at the course? Time. That's your tea time. You should be able to do cartwheels and do <laughs> jumping jacks and do whatever you want beforehand. And when they call your name, if you're not there, get stroked. Sure. But you should, there shouldn't be. I know, but thing. they're calling your name now five minutes before. They're calling your name five minutes. So that's now your official time. That's like what you have I'm your saying. official so time, and then that. you have your tea so time. So then just say, hey, guess what? Your, your tea time is 1246. You have to be there five minutes early so you can figure out how to do a, a digital scorecard. I mean, what are we talking card. about here? What other, what other sport are you showing up when the game starts? Like, oh, the game, game starts at 8 o'clock. So if I'm playing a game at 8 o'clock, I can show up at 7.50. What are we talking about here? Everyone, every, there's the different times no, no, always no, 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 no. for Brody, other sports Brody. as if well of when if, you need to show up for the actual no. game. You're show, It's different. Yes. Right? No, you. if I'm playing basketball, if I'm playing basketball and the game starts at 12 o'clock <laughs> and I'm sitting there shooting free throws right here and they're like, okay, before you're done with that, you have to come over here five minutes beforehand and you have to talk about how we're keeping score today, Paul. And we're going to tell you about the nice coupon. Well, they we do have kick you the off alley. the court. Yeah, well, they do, the co- they do kick the you game. off the court at I'm a certain in, time. No, I'm in the game. I better be. It doesn't matter if I run out there and they're about to do tip off. There's a time limit for me to be on there. And if I make it in my time yeah. limit, then it's time for me to go. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I jump on. I feel like we're I agreeing here. I feel like we're agreeing. Maybe. <laughs> We I feel like we're sometimes agreeing. Sometimes we have a weird way of agreeing, I, I, which I like. <laughs> no, I think I, I, th- I think we are agreeing because I don't want to show up five minutes before to hear no. about the macaroni dinner later tonight for all the players. That's I don't. I that's like not why I want to show up us. five minutes before. Well, if they do, we'll smack them in the face and no, tell them to stop doing that. Do. I, I want us to. I want us to pick a time to where we can show up to where it's just like. It's a little bit. I used to think it's a little bit more professional having everyone there. So when the the time is called, someone's not sprinting we've had, in we've actually to their tea time and not time getting penalized. Game. It's called the two minute warning. You had two minutes before, before your real tea time. There you go. Two minutes. I, that's perfect. Two minutes. Boom. If you're not there to, before two have minutes. Have you ever done that? Stroke. Have them. you ever done a shotgun start? Or are you too new? 
Actually, find them. Find them. Don't stroke them. Have, just find them. Have you? No. You've never. You've never. So. Uh, you've been, yes. I mean, I did. No, no. I did at. Uh, I did at DMC last year when we got. Um, I'm talking like a smaller when we, like, tournament. We started one of the where mornings. Everybody's chilling, and then no, everybody no, yells I, I, ten I, minutes. No. No. That was the, that was no, the way we did it all so. back in the day. Two minutes is what you had. I think I've done, I've done like and local. If you, were putting, you get, excuse me, you'd get stroked <laughs> and then you had to wait. I like that. And then sometimes our I two like minutes that. would last like five minutes and we're like, who's going to yell two minutes? This is bull crap. And then finally you'd hear one like way <laughs> off in the distance and be like, I think that was it. Two minutes. And then you're going. And then some people weren't going. It was a, it was a nightmare. I had to deal with it for like that sounds years. Seems like you need an air horn in that scenario. Um, all right, let's jump to FPO here. We, we went off the rails there a little bit. Sorry. Uh, we're back on it. Owns Scoggins, takes it down. She wins without a single birdie on any par three. Didn't birdie any par threes all tournament. Ended up only taking one bogey the entire tournament. That, whole, uh, that bogey ended up actually being her final. Wait, that's not even, that's not even accurate. She took two bogeys. All right. Okay, normally I'm just going with stat Mando 100%, but she bogeyed hole 16 and she bogeyed hole 18. So maybe she only bogeyed, uh, let me see, did she only bogey two times? No, she bogeyed hole five. I don't know what stat I pulled. I have no idea what that stat is. She has a lot of bogeys. The one stat will be accurate, though, is she did not birdie any par three. She never took a two. Wow. Yes, that is that is accurate, and that is from Stat Mando. So credit to Stat Mando that that is accurate. Uh, no birdies on any par threes, uh, but ends up shooting twenty five under. Takes it down. Uh, your top ten was Ella Hansen, Cat Merch, Missy Gannon, Holland Hanley, Jennifer Allen, Maria Oliva, Sarah Hokum, Haley King, and Jessica Weiss. Uh, there was your top ten. You also had another massive tournament going on mainly why we didn't see a lot of the European uh, players over at the first playoff event, which again, I don't understand these playoffs. I don't think anyone does. If someone understands these playoffs, please let me know. Cause I just looked. Do you know how many people are, there were, there were 70, would we say 76 people? Yeah. 76 people in the field at uh, the first playoff event. Okay. I thought I was under the impression that moving on would be like difficult, right? Like it's like a playoff. So now moving to MVP, there's going to be like less people playing at MVP. I think there's like 68 people playing at MVP right now, right now. So like eight people get cut like that. I don't, I don't know what's going on. It, Nobody's it getting none cut. of this makes sense. I, none MVP. of this makes sense. Like let's have a hundred people at D glow, drop it down to 60 at MVP and then drop it down to your 32 at the tour championship. E I got an email saying, okay, just like D glow, we're having, we're not having a cut at MVP. Did you get that email? Probably. I don't like it. I don't like four round tournaments with no cut. What are we doing? Cuts. No, I don't cut like, people. I don't give a crap about any of that. What I care about is the whole year we're making cuts at, at Massachusetts. That's what it says. The whole year it says we're making cut at Deglo. Then we get two weeks prior to both. Oh, you're saying last cuts. second they change him. What the heck? Someone is crying. Someone's crying. I don't know who they are, but there is someone crying. And clearly the uh, Disc Golf Pro Tour uh, cares about this person's tears. Because I don't, I don't, I don't get I don't it. Understand. I don't understand... I don't understand the uh, the switching to but it. But Owen, um, I want to say this. Owen Scoggins, undoundedly oh, second best player yes. in the world. Second best player in the world. I'm saying it. She's I don't think it's close. I, uh, yeah, I don't I, think it's close. I think it goes Kristen, Owen, Gap right now. Well, Missy. Missy. After playing these. Missy and Missy's Owen, up there too. But Missy after playing Owen these battle. courses. We might we might see a world's battle. We might see a world's battle. That's, that's all I'm going to say on FPO. It might it might we might finally get what we've been looking for uh, this whole time with Kristen Tatar actually having to go down to the wire. Imagine if Own wins the Masters World Championship and then wins the World Championship. I mean, come on. 
That'd be crazy. That that's gonna be tough. That's gonna be tough for anyone to do. That's that's gonna be tough. She um, could do it. Okay, so like I said, the European disc. No, she definitely could. No, one thousand percent. She she could win USCGC too. I mean, she <laughs> she's good enough to win everything. I'm excited. Anyway, it, keep it, going. She yeah, her game games. is her game. Her game is very good. Um, all right, European Disc Golf Championship went down. This went down in Tallinn, Estonia. I hope I said that correctly. Uh, this is why we did not see any of the real top European players playing over at Diglo, which was you know sad if we're trying to build out this playoff thing. You know, you have a huge part of your roster not playing there. Uh, Dennis Augustin absolutely just destroyed the field, won by 10 shots over Jesse Niemannen. Um, big names over there. Albert, T- Albert Tom finished uh, tied for fifth. Nicholas Antilla finished tied for seventh. Vino Makala finished tied for 10th. On the FPO side, uh, that was where the big storylines for me went down. Um, did not know this. Kristen Tatar, this was the one tournament or the final tournament rather that Kristen kind of had on her wish list. She said, uh, this was the one that she had not won, I guess yet. And it being in her home country of Estonia, I think it was adding a little bit more pressure and definitely one that she wanted to take down. Absolutely came out crushing the first three rounds. Her second round was one of her best rounds in her entire career. She had a 16-stroke lead after the first three rounds and then proceeded to have, quite frankly, probably the most emotional disc golf round I've ever seen. Um, It was just un-Kristen Tatar-like, if you will. That might be the best way of saying it. She buries the first hole, triples the second hole, then proceeds to birdie the next two, then goes bogey, double, double, bogey, bogey. And all of a sudden, her lead is kind of like evaporating right in front of her eyes. Uh, If you haven't yet, definitely go check out her posts on Instagram. I think her latest post does a really great job of just kind of going through the emotions that she was going through um, during that final round. But she... Just missed tons of putts that final round. Threw a bunch of shots OB. Uh, really was just off her game the entire time. Um, but ended up, you know, finishing par birdie to win by three shots and uh, took it down. And so a super gutty win there because I think once, I mean, we've all been there when the rails start going. It's tough. It's tough to get back on the tracks. And she was able to figure it out. So hats off to her. That's a big lead to blow. <laughs> Bro. 13 shots, yeah. Bro, that's a big lead, dude. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Hats off. You yeah. better. Nuts. Otherwise you're going into well, history I'm just saying, books like, like the the biggest I, blown lead ever. Biggest choke of all time. All time. Yeah. Um now, obviously, a bunch of people started going on social media talking about she was injured. She she did have some of that. Um, what do they call that? That tape? What do they call that? tape? Yeah, she had some of that on her throwing arm. So I think some people were worried. Oh, my gosh. Not injured. She She said nothing along the lines of any injury or anything nagging her. She basically was just talking about the stress of wanting to win this so bad and then things not going her way just compounded to, you know, a very poor round. Um, Yuli, they're telling me to have you close all your other browser tabs That's what I open saw. with Riverside. I don't know what that means. I don't know why they're doing that. These people over here are very, very serious, I guess. They take, they take their job very seriously over here. Um, but, yes, I think, I think we shouldn't be worried about her coming into Worlds. I, I think she should be firing on all cylinders unless we hear something differently. I think she should be healthy. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, she just checked the last check mark off her career list. That's pretty cool. Um, listen. I'm listening. I don't know. I don't know how I can't say, like, I don't want to say she's going to win by 10, but at a five-round event, like, how do I not say that? 
It's going to be tough. I just think she's going to I just hope it's close. Like, I just g- give me something. Give me something oh, close going Owen's going to throw a bunch round. of flex like sidearms in the Owen. woods and just drain 45 Missy, footers. Missy, own Missy, Cat Merch. Yep. Holland Hanley, let's go. Let's get the let's get the freaking let's get it going. Yep. Let's let's make something Holland happen. Let's Hanley make this a freaking nowhere, exciting just... world championship. They're just, just coming psh, at, psh, and then all of a sudden, psh, Kristen's in like ninth, coming back two rounds. All of a sudden, she's on the chase. Oh car, my gosh, heaters! I would oh. love that. Yep. I would love that. Be- uh, let's do a quick disc golf pro tour standings update. Because, like I said, not that many events left. So I kind of just want to talk about maybe like the last, the first seven. Or let's do let's let's do five. Let's do five and five. So the first five in and the last five out. Right now, the first five in, you have Nico LoCastro, Chris Clemens, Vino Makala, Andrew Presnell, and Mason Ford. Yeah. Those right now are the are the are sitting on the good the side of the bubble. Yeah, the, the ones out. The Guardians, the ones outside the bubble, you've got Robert Burridge, Garrett Gerthy, you, Yuli, Eric Oakley, Chandler Kramer. These are the people that are just outside the bubble. Now, the point difference, like looking at you, Yuli, the point difference between you being in and out right now is 41 points yep. with a world championship, which is counting at 1.5, and then with another playoff event counting at 1.5. There are a lot of points up for grabs, a lot of points on the table. If any of the if any of the uh, the guys just in the bubble play poorly, and any of the guys just below the bubble play play well, we will see a switcher do a, sw- yep. a switcher do a switcher sw- a switcher do switcher do. I think is what yeah, I'm trying no, to say. I like what you said first. A switcher do. Yeah, yeah. So something to keep an eye on. Uh, de- and I think at this point, I believe you disc if you want. I think after each round, they start putting projected points, which is awesome. That is so cool. you could see at the end of you each round like, right now where your standings would be. You yeah. could be on 18 at MVP being like, I have to go to the, for this birdie to make to make the Pro Tour Championship. Yep. That's cool. Yep. I love that. Very, very cool. I really don't want to have to uh, birdie that okay, quick to make sh- the, the championship, by the way. Or do oh, I? I? I would. Do we? Because that means ha- I'm close. Right. I, right, I do right, because right. I, I don't know. Yes. I don't know now. Yes. I want to just be in, or do I want to? If I had to right I'm, now, I'm, accept I'm the fate. farther away than you. <laughs> but if we had to accept our fate right now, like, I want the chance. You want the? We're taking the chance. Yes, or do I, I think chance. that I'm just gonna get in? Yes. With good play. No, I'll take the chance. Give it. To I know, me. but if I'll you take, told I'll take if you chance. told me you have to birdie to get in, and I feel like my odds my odds are way better birding eighteen and getting in than just like letting the cards fall as oh, they yeah. will right now. But one top uh, ten, you're because I need to play. <sighs> maybe, maybe so. it's uh, you also need the other people above you to play bad. Yeah, because um, if they top ten, then your top ten means nothing. And then the so, people in front of you, Mason um, all right. Ford. Is a world, is a world's guy. Like that guy yeah, is a I mean, top. Yeah, like for like gonna, three uh, years in a row, he's taken top ten at worlds. I mean, Nico's gonna Nico's gonna play good. Scrapper. Presnell's probably gonna shred Brewster. I mean, it's it's <laughs> gonna be tough. Uh, all right, want to do a quick shout out to Jim Palmieri's. Oh, I'm gonna say that wrong. Jim do you Palmieri. Know how to pronounce that name? P A L. Palmieri. Jim Palmieri, fiftieth. And, and 50th American Flying Disc Open Silver Event going this going down this weekend in Rochester, New York. Now, I, I want to address a tweet that I was, uh, you know, I first want to say that I hope the event goes well. I hope everyone enjoys the event. I hope all the spectators that show up have a great time. Um, I hope it goes well. And I, I'll say... Us as, as professional players, we get to pick our schedules right now. Some tournaments are way more incentivized than others. And unfortunately for this tournament, this is this has nothing to do with the actual tournament, has nothing to do with the course, has nothing to do with the community of Rochester, New York. It simply has to do with scheduling. They put this tournament in Rochester, which I believe is like six to eight out. I think it's like a six and a half hour drive from where we are right now. It's not that far. That tournament's going to end on Sunday. That is far. 
No, I was saying six and a half hours, saying that is kind of far. Because that tournament ends on Sunday. Unless you're going to drive through the night, you're probably going to most likely show up on sometime Monday. And that gives you some, some of Monday and Tuesday to practice for Worlds on two courses. Not a lot of time. Not a lot of prep. And... It is what it is, man. It, it's it was it was poorly timed. Uh, I do want to shout out the crazy tweet of the week. This came from John Anderson. This was in a reply to my t- tweet saying Toronto is legit. Me, uh, Gooseman, and Ezra stopped in Toronto on our way over here, and it was just a picture of the skyline. And his response to my picture of the skyline of Toronto was, "Thanks for bailing on this week's Silver Series." And a big F to all the other pros who couldn't bother for making this week, week making this weakest field all year. And no FPO. Zero respect. Hope reigns all day in Toronto. Um, I'm guessing it's a local person in Rochester that was kind of upset. Now, I get maybe some of the people that are upset because some of the pros that maybe backed out of the tournament super late. I think I dropped this tournament well in advance. I want to say I dropped this tournament maybe a month, maybe two months ago. So my name hasn't been on the list for a while. Now, the question, why was your name on the list at all? When we sign up for the tour card, it signs you up for everything. You get signed up for everything. And then we have to go in and manually tell the Disc Golf Pro Tour, we're not playing this event. So that kind we normally do that a month or two months in advance. Some people do it a week before. And so I get the frustration maybe from some people that are like, Oh my gosh, like these, all these people are coming to play this tournament sick. And they look the next day and all those people have dropped. I get that frustration, but I don't, I mean, it is what it is, right? Yulia, what were we supposed to do? It is tough. I'll say this, see the people on the list buy tickets see those people see them drop not okay yep. but on the other side like i think i dropped it two three days three days ago i think i dropped okay i wasn't sure if i might go i, I was thinking i might go there uh-huh after d glow i was sitting um sunday night and i was like yeah i'm not going like this is I'm too stressed. This was a tough week. You know, all the stuff we have to do at Deglo with all the signings and this and that and yep. disc release. And I was just like, no, I need, I need time to digress. I need to go home, um, for a few days. And that, that was my decision. Guess what? I'm allowed to make that decision. Do you think they sell tickets too early? I don't know. I don't know when they sell tickets. Could that could that solve the problem if they don't sell t- if they don't open up tickets until the Monday before the tournament? So no one's buying tickets two months in advance, being like, "All oh, these people are coming!" It's oh my sports. gosh, it's sports. Some people drop, some people don't. Listen, I bought a ticket to um, go watch LeBron last last year. Right, bought a ticket, was injured, didn't play. That sucked. Yeah, but it happened. Yeah, I mean, the still injury went to a sporting sure, event, right? and there were still awesome players, yeah. and I got to watch basketball, and I, I had a great time. It happens. I'll just throw my name in. I'll throw my name in the mix because I don't want to wish any uh, bad juju on anyone. But you might be showing up to Worlds to watch me play, and I might get injured, literally Tuesday. Yeah, and I'm dropping right. Like that could happen. So uh, the injury thing, I can see for sure, but. Um, it's just, yeah, he was not very plan- happy. It so, well, it wasn't planned very well. Listen, the only reason you can't have a tournament gone, the week before Worlds, especially when it starts on Wednesday. It would you be really it. smart for me to go there to try to get points right now. Really smart. I had to weigh that option with the fact that I was a little burnt out after Deglo, and I have the World Championships coming up. How am I supposed to be burnt yeah. out when I have the World Championships coming out? Listen, there is, there is three things you can do in this game to make any sort of effect or any sort of mark. Three things. Work your freaking butt off for years and years and years and years and years. Okay? That's one way. The next one is, I think there's just two. <laughs> you work really, really hard for a long, long time, <laughs> or you win the world championships. 
Like, that's it. <laughs> There's no other way to make money in this game. There isn't. There isn't. You could, like, that's it. That's all. that. And for the longest time, for 15 years, that was the only way you could ever make any money is if you won the world championships. It's the biggest thing in our game. It sucks. But that's the way that it is. It's our biggest event. If you want to have your name on a disc for the rest of your life, that's the only way to do it. It's the only way. Yeah, I think I think the I think the only two events that I'm going to be you know, a week pri- a week uh, uh there uh, how much I say this? The only two events I'm going to be there a week before they start, World Championships and USCDC. Those are the only two. And I think USCDC there's another silver event potentially before that one, or maybe there is a completely off week. Um, but those are really the only two events. And I think those are probably the only two events for most players as well. And there's a reason for that. So if I'm the disc golf pro tour looking to, you know, reschedule moving forward, change some things up, probably that should probably be an off week. What, what would your life look Worlds. like Brody? If you won the world champ, just to give this guy perspective, what would your life look like after you win a world championship in Vermont. What would, how would it well, change? Well, I don't, yeah, for me, it wouldn't really change like fi- me financially fi- no, at no, all. No, I'm saying like, as it w- far as publicity, different things like yeah, that. Yeah, no, I think, I th- yeah, for, for, yeah, for, for some, for, I would say it would, it would be a much bigger impact for a lot of other players than myself. And so, like, I'm kind of an anomaly in that fact. But if I did win, I mean, there's not a tournament that is even close to having the impact that that would have. It would, it would be, uh, it would be a massive, a massive accomplishment, but also too, I think it would be something that would even, uh, potentially stretch outside of just disc golf, right? This is something that I could potentially move, uh, move on to other media outside of disc golf to talk about it as yeah. well. So it would be a massive, massive thing, not just for myself, but also for disc golf. Yes. Uh, That's and I would say for the majority of, yeah, the majority of other players though, if they won, it, it is literally life changing yeah. for some players of where you could literally have someone be like, I am not touring next year. I am done. And then they win a world championship. And then it's like, Never mind. I I'm going <laughs> full in on disc golf next yeah. year. So it it is completely That's, life changing for the majority of people on tour. And so this Yahoo who 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 tweets out, he hopes it rains on you because you're trying to get ready to f- change the game. Well, jokes on him. I'm not in Toronto anymore. So <laughs> you're potentially trying to change <laughs> the game for the better. Like, come on, dude. Yeah. But did it rain? Kind of crazy. <laughs> No, no rain in Toronto. We Dang. filmed an awesome video. It'll be coming soon, so make sure to Did check it out. Did you play Toronto YouTube. Island? Yes. Oh, Sick course. Fun, huh? And I, we, we talked about how this could be like a silver event. Like oh, you, could, you could spruce it up a little bit and make it a sick silver event that in the future. Awesome. So, um, uh, Will Schustrick posted on Instagram saying that he will be playing this year at USDC. That's that's awesome news. Great to see. There was some talk about him earlier, about him like coming back, and then I don't know what I happened. But awesome to see him back at USCDC. He's he's not old. Like it's not like he's past his prime. Like he could he could make a comeback for sure, and that would be an incredible dude, story. The dude line. was if he got himself the back in the mix. Unbelievable. He was unbelievable. Like I'm talking shots that were like. <laughs> Not supposed to be thrown. He was way before his time. Way before, or before his time, or way we'll before. S- we'll How do you see. say that? Like he was before. He was way before his time. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, no, I think that might be the right way of saying it. Some something along those lines. <laughs> you guys um, get what I'm saying. Trevor, tr- <laughs> someone knows what you're talking about. <laughs> I hope so. uh, Trevor just launched a new channel, so shout out to Trevor if you haven't. Yeah. Go subscribe to Trevor's new YouTube channel. He's going to be posting uh, mostly disc golf stuff, but it'll be de- a little bit separate from the foundation content that he normally posts. So if you are a big fan of Trevor, go check out his new YouTube channel. I don't know. I don't think he has enough subscribers to have a name yet because he literally just created it. So best thing to do is probably go on his Twitter or if you literally just search Trevor Disc Golf, it will pop up as uh or trevor new channel disc golf it should pop up his latest video that he just did 
Um, all right, we have a couple of listener questions, and that is going to wrap us up this week. Um, here's a question from Dante. He says, is there a policy for players and officials spoiling tournament results before people have a chance to watch on post? I'm wondering how long I have to avoid Twitter when I miss a live broadcast. Was this a sarcastic post? I could not tell you. Lee. No, he's being serious. So the answer oh, he's to being that, serious. Okay. Yeah, the answer to yeah. that is we're adults <laughs> and sports happen live. That's how they happen. And I, I'm sorry, but when, when, but when I'm looking for results on the golf, I watch golf every weekend. I try to, and I find out that somebody won. I have, I give zero. You know what? Zero. <laughs> like I don't understand why. Yeah, that's are such you a mad? Are you mad at that person, or are you mad at yourself for spoiling it? For, I feel like I'm mad at myself yeah. for spoiling it. I, yeah. I'm never like mad at that person for talking about something i've always the fact that we have live and people still don't watch the live and they watch post produce which helps me i mean that's my one of my jobs is to commentate on post produ produce product but for me personally i've never watched a post produce product in my life that wasn't disc golf ever the only time i've ever done it is on espn when they're showing me highlights like I just don't yeah, know. or I'll like I'll I'll like stumble across like a random CrossFit from like 2018. I'm like, oh, or like I'll a watch, UFC I'll fight where this. I want to see the dude get knocked out. You know, where I want to see like how it happened. yeah, you go, you go back and yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's 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 definitely it. harder nowadays to like to not get spoiled by live sports. It's it's way harder now yeah. than it used to be. That's for sure. Um, all right, Jackson Clark, do you like the idea of a Netflix show like Drive to Survive or Quarterbacks for Disc Golf? Do you think that is even possible? Seeing how it made F1 explode in the U.S., I think it would be awesome for the sport. Well, it depends on who you had on there, first of all. Like, I think there's room for it, but I don't know what with the personalities we have in Disc Golf. I don't know. I don't know. I, I would say this. I would say the lifestyle – the things that happen in Drive to Survive is very entertaining. There's a lot of stuff going on, very entertaining. I think you could make one episode, like you could do a one and a half hour documentary yeah, of like I what agree. it's like to be a pro disc golfer and, and have a couple different people and mesh it all together. I don't think this would work week to week basis. It's yeah. most people, there's not enough crazy stuff happening. Mm -mm. It would. I don't think it would attract people outside of the sport. I think maybe some people in the sport would like to watch it, but outside oh, of the sport, sport you'd love it. Yeah, I don't think I don't think it would uh really make sense and I don't think that's going to like make people yeah. all of a sudden be like, "Oh, I need to go watch disc golf." Um all right, Jacob says, "Should Canada have a few tu tour stops?" So I think right now I believe Prince Edward Island what is is that is that what that's called you know what i'm talking about is that called prince edward island i don't know I'm not looking just maybe open <laughs> no i wasn't i i was it's not on my screen it's called the dismania open it is in prince edward island which okay. is in canada yeah okay so there's there's one silver event this year in canada does canada need more events should we have something in toronto should we have something out in uh Wow, I'm blanking on the name. Vancouver. I love Canada. Should should we yes. try to deal. Should we try to make more events up there? I think it makes sense, especially after Deglo. Let's go to Toronto. Yeah, we're real close. Toronto's an amazing yeah. city. It by wasn't the way. that bad. Dude, Toronto was awesome. Yeah. Toronto was very cool. Yeah. Um they have all right. the Raptors, dude. Let's go I'm all to about the Raptor. Here's the thing, Yoli. The field is is so crazy. This upcoming week, we're not doing picks. Okay. I'm just not doing it. It's not. I'm refusing to do picks, <laughs> but I will recap last week's picks. Right. Um, Eagle got me three with his second place. Uh, AB got me one with his ninth place. You picked a winner again with Simon Lazat. Right. Back to back weeks for you. Congratulations. And you got three points for Cole Rodolin. Um, 
which brings now you into a pretty commanding lead, 92 to 85. However, we've obviously world championship coming up. Those are double points, massive, massive points on the board coming up. Uh, so that's where we're at right now. You are kind of dominating me a little bit here towards the end of the stretch. I have gone into a little bit of a cold funk. I need to bounce back. Uh, but we're going to take a week off. We're going to give myself a little bit of time. I'm going to, you know, crunch the numbers, see, okay. see what we're looking like and, uh, come back next week stronger with my picks. Cause you never know. Uh, but do you got anything else? Go, if somebody's going to drop due to injury, rainy guy. Yes. Sorry. I will say it is nice that we do our picks on Wednesday. It'd be a lot harder to do our picks on Monday than on Wednesday. Um, can we do, do you our, have anything else? Can, Did we miss can anything? Can we do our podcast next Tuesday? Since we play on Wednesday. You, I was literally just going to talk to you about that. I think what we should do. <coughs> I think we should try to. Because um, my Airbnb is absolutely disgusting. It's very sick. So I think what we should try to do is maybe try to get one or two guests next week. I've got a couple people of mine. We'll talk about it off air. Maybe people listening to the show can tweet us about who they would love to yeah, listen to going guys. into Worlds. And uh, if you're watching on YouTube, comment down below. Uh, but I think we maybe have a couple guests leading into Worlds talking about, you know, what it would mean for them to win. Um, and we do the show, like we record it on Monday and then we release it on like Wednesday night okay. or something. I think that might be the play. I do not want to not. Uh, do it after my round on Wednesday. No. no. You just you're just saying you're not going to no. do it. I said I didn't want to. I'm you're not, just you're just saying happening. you're not doing it. Okay. I All just right. told you All I right. didn't then go we to plan, We will plan. We will plan on I'm not podding. <laughs> just kidding. I'll do it. I'll so do we it will plan it. on uh we'll plan on we'll plan on filming on Monday. So it will be a little bit of a pre-recorded episode for you guys, but we'll hopefully have some good guests on next yeah. week uh, going into the world championship and uh, make sure you watch the American flying disc open this week. I'll Show your watching. support for Rochester. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious. I mean, it's, it's going to be a wide open tournament yeah. that that is for sure. And, and I will say this too. There is a little a bit of a lure. That? I'm not picking. No, I'm not picking. I refuse. Rochester? But I, I, I will say there is a, there, there is a little bit of a, uh, you know, when you go and watch, uh, you, again, when you watch these top level players play on these courses, you rarely see kind of mistakes happen down the wire. We might see some mistakes. We might see some crazy stuff happen at the at the end of where one of these people that haven't been in contention to win a tournament all season is like right there in the driver's seat. Matteo so was still it could be it could have some list. fireworks. Matteo's gonna he's gonna win. He's on the list right now. He was on the list. I think he's gonna I, win. I don't think he's playing. There's no chance he's playing. He might be playing. There's no chance. He doesn't need the points. Really? Well maybe he we'll hasn't see. he hasn't won an elite I'll, I'll be, series. I, this is it's choice. not an elite. It's a silver. That's no one's going to care if he wins what, that's that. That's what everybody's saying, bro. All right. All right. Fair <laughs> enough. All right. Well, that's all we got for you this week, guys. Thanks so much for tuning yeah. in. We appreciate everything. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Drop a like. We don't really talk about that much, but on YouTube, if you can like these video, uh, the videos, we really appreciate it. And then uh, drop some ratings on your Apple podcast, Spotify, whatever you listen to on here. And uh, we appreciate you guys so much. And we will see you next week for Worlds, baby. Get ready for it.